This is my review of the SMC Takamar 51.4. This is by far my favorite lens. I'm currently filming on the 35 3.5. The Takamar 35 3.5 pairs excellent. It pairs excellently with the 51.4 if you're looking for a two lens combo for street photography or just travel everyday use. The 35 and the 50 go great together. The reason I don't film video talking head stuff like this on the 50 is because I don't have a lav mic and I don't feel like setting up my studio mics so that uh, I have to actually be quite close to my A6400 for the microphone to really pick things up nicely. Yeah, so this is where we're going to be at from now on. The Takamar 51.4 comes in quite a few varieties. I have a 7 million serial number, so one of the later versions. Um, I have no problems with it. People say the earlier ones are sharper or not as sharp, but honestly, the amazing qualities of this lens are not lost on any of the versions. Uh, I've tested the Ada Element version and it didn't really justify the cost. And after I ran the tests on um, with a Geiger counter. Uh, I was going to pick up an 88 element version because I was worried about radioactive exposure but I did a lot of tests with a Geiger counter just to be completely confident that I wasn't going to uh, get too much exposure and it's, it's safe. I can, I'll put numbers later in the video with some actual examples next to the Geiger counter so we can calculate its safe dose so it's near the end of the video but I can tell you with 100% certainty. Not medical advice, but it is safe to keep this lens in your pocket for a year and you you have a very, very small increase in your risk of cancer, but it's incredibly minor. I've left it on my Sony a6400 for a 10 month straight, uh, so I can confirm that there's no loss of image quality uh, for leaving it on a mirrorless sensor, even very close to it for an extended periods of time. It might be longer. If you leave it on there longer, you might have dead pixels or something. But 10 months straight, you're okay. And I think that's a pretty ridiculous long time to leave one lens on any camera. When people say it's radioactive, they mean compared to not being radioactive, not an exceptional amount of radioactivity. A piece of glass by itself does not have radioactive decay the thorium in the glass has some radioactive decay, so it is mentioned it is not a dangerous amount by any means. If you've made it this far into all of the Takamar 50 reviews, I'm sure you know everything about this lens already. Um, so I'm just going to go into a bunch of samples of pictures I've taken. This has been my daily driver for the last year and a half. Uh, I've done quite a few tests on the radioactivity. I actually bought a Gallagher counter because I was using the lens so much. I live in Hanoi, Vietnam, and it's currently Tet. This first image is from one of the Tet markets. If you don't listen to any of my advice on how to use this lens, the only thing I want you to remember, wide open, there's a lot of artifacts. If you go a half click, not even a full step, a, a half click down on the aperture ring, it removes so many, so much fringing, so much chroma. Uh, so here you can see I have stopped it down half a click. It removes the circles. Um, there aren't enough aperture rings on this to get full circles, um, but it's fine. It's fine. Uh, you can see, you can see just how sharp it is, uh, even almost wide open razor sharp. In the left here on these fake leaves uh, there is some color fringing. Let me turn off processing. Excuse me. Um, I shoot in a log profile so your out-of-camera results will be a little bit different if you're shooting with your uh, normal picture profiles. 
but you can see a little bit of color fringing specifically on the out of focus areas um, it can get pretty rough sometimes but it's very easily correctable in in Lightroom and other um, other programs here is a great example of how the image transitions to out of focus you can see you can see each individual ring of the cups and how it just gradually turns into just nothing it's really really interesting to look at again here you can see a little bit of chromatic aberration let's turn on unedited my edits are actually bringing it out but it's okay another great example this one was shot wide open uh, you can just see how incredibly sharp it is wide open I mean this plane of the focus has to be under one inch and it just looks gorgeous Uh, one thing I love shooting with this lens is flower picks. I'm gonna make a whole video on why I love shooting flower pictures so much. Uh, but it really, the, the colors are 10 out of 10. Great. Um, another piece of advice if you're using this lens, and Tacomars in general, their highlights are a little bit stronger than most lenses. So I, I tend to t pull the highlights down quite a bit. Uh, if you're shooting in if you're shooting things with a lot of highlights, it can tend to make things a little bit wet looking. And if things are already wet, it'll just blow them out. I have examples later on of this effect, but you can see even without image correction, specifically Tacomars and the 51.4 do reds amazingly well. I've noticed greens and yellows are a little bit more dull but the way they render reds, even in a log pro profile, just pops. It's just, it's just gorgeous. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. Like I said, I love flower pictures, and the 51.4 is a phenomenal flower lens. Um, it's not that I even really enjoy looking at them so much, but just the technical quality. Uh, you really get to show off the technical aspects of the lens. Um, you can see here, this is a great example of just too much highlights. Uh, sometimes the 50 will give a little too much highlight, but it's it's easily correctable. And again, because I'm in a log profile, it's exa it's exaggerated here. But it the way it transitions from in focus to out of focus, just it's so satisfying. It like it's just so satisfying. Um, I'm gonna try to focus on portraits a little bit in this review. I don't shoot too many portraits, but this lens is 10 out of 10 for portrait photography. Um, when I say 10 out of 10, I'm relating it to other vintage lenses. Uh, it doesn't really compare to modern lens sharpness and color correct, color accuracy and all that, but I don't care about any of that. I just, this, this is in the realm of vintage lenses and this is one of the best vintage lenses for portraiture. Um, the bokeh is kind of busy. Some people don't like it, but personally I prefer having a little bit more texture in my bokeh because it can give you a more bold, uh, it gives you more bold decisions, bold, more bold qualities. So if this was just completely blown out and flat, the focus would be on the subject, of course. But because we have a little bit more texture in the background, it, it makes the whole image a little bit more interesting and obviously with portrait and subject photography you want the subject to be the focal ground but if you have a little bit more busyness in the background uh, it it can just make the whole image pop a little bit more especially because skin tones her skin tones are really smooth and then you get some some interesting textures in the background that just I don't know personally I love it it's really really beautiful uh, here's a great example of color uh, rendering. I'm going to turn off processing. As I said before, greens and yellows are a little bit dull, but the reds just mwah, mwah, love it. I love it. This is, if you've never seen it, this is a banana tree. Um, this is not the Cavendish. Cavendish? The western banana. These are very small bananas. They get about this long. Um, but yeah, this is a banana flower. With processing back on, and you'll see it here, I really abuse 
blue shadows, yellow highlights. I just love the split tone look. Uh, but you can see background. In this example, less so than the previous example, the background is quite a bit smoother. Um, it takes if you have quite a, if you have distance or if your background's essentially at infinity, you'll get a lot more texture in your background. If your background's not at infinity, uh, it tends to be a little bit more smooth. On full frame, you can get some swirls if your background's not at infinity. I shoot on a crop sensor, so I won't be able to showcase that off here today, but it does exist on this lens. And if you've seen all the other hundreds of 50, one point Tecumar 51.4 reviews on YouTube, which if you're watching this, I'm sure this is not the first one you've watched. Um, I'm sure you've seen the swirls. Um, this is another one of my favorite images that I've gotten out of this. Another great example of the highlights. <clears throat> you can see without processing, again, log profile, not an objective experience, but without processing the highlights kind of overwhelm the, the contrast a little bit. Uh, especially in these water droplets down here, they're they're not clipping, but they're close. They're they're close. A little bit of processing. You can see the color fringing here, but I kind of like how it it uh, it adds a little bit of extra color. Let's go in and turn off the fringe, like try to correct the fringing just a bit. <coughs> so that that fixes it a bit. Um, we don't really need to do it, and if we don't need to do it, we're not going to do it. But you can see, this is shot uh, stop down, just a half click. Excellent sharpness. Excellent sharpness. Uh, I shoot with a helicoid adapter. I uh, highly recommend a helicoid adapter over a speed booster uh, if you're on a crop sensor. Personal opinion, obviously. If you want full frame optics, you do you. But with a, a helicoid adapter, you get so much con more control over the, um, the plane of focus. You can really, really get blown out backgrounds. This, this image here would not be cap uh, possible without a helicoid adapter. And yeah, uh, I included this next one because I wanted to show uh, something at infinity. I don't really shoot in infinity. I, I use my 35 3.5, my Super Tacomar 35 3.5 uh, for landscapes, but uh, when I went on this trip I didn't have any other lens. So here's a good example of sharpness at infinity. Great. Uh, this is in a mountain range, uh, probably 50 kilometers outside of Hanoi, maybe about an hour and a half by drive outside of Hanoi. Um, but you can see the sharpness is perfect for a vintage lens, for a vintage lens. Um, when we're, we take a step back and have a bird's eye view, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with its ability to take landscape. The focal range isn't great, but obviously that's not a problem with this lens, that's just the uh, aspect of the focal range. So let's turn off processing. Um, again, you can see with the highlights a little high. Like I, I turned on the highlights quite a bit on all of these. Um, it was, this was probably seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, so it was very foggy. But we still even get a good amount of detail in the uh, in the foggy backgrounds. Like you can still see individual branches on the horizon, all of that. Processing back on. Ooh, I hate you, lightning. There we go. Yeah, um, I don't like this person. Uh, we don't need to go into that here, but I don't enjoy this person. But it's a great example of the circle bokeh you can get. Obviously some uh, color fringing on the circles, but in the right lighting, in the right, with the right subject, you could get these really, really cool textured backgrounds. And as I said before, it's not always about smoothness with bokeh. You can make a statement, and if everything is just perfectly flat, you're not making a statement. It's not bold. You're not taking. You're not making. Uh, you're not taking advantage of the optimal characteristics of your subject. So you can see, kind of in the corners here. If I was on full frame, 
I would be getting a slight swirling in this background. You can see cat's eyes just turning, just beginning in the corners. My on a full frame, it'd be, it'd be much more noticeable. Uh, I like this image. This isn't anything I'd distribute or put on a print or anything, but it's a good example of just how sh how tiny the plane of focus is, especially with a helicoid adapter. So these are, I believe this is the pistula of the flower. Uh, when you're taking flower picks, you always want to focus on the pistula. Pistula? St stigma? Yeah, the stigma. You always want to be focused on the stigma. Um, with no processing, again, highlights are a little bit out of control. That's not what I wanted. Um, but you can see with processing, if we zoom all the way in, the chroma gets a little bit out of control. I could have fixed this, but again, this isn't an image I'd be distributing. This was just a picture for my family and uh, my own enjoyment of taking flower picks. Um, and nobody's really going to be staring at this in an art gallery three inches from their face. This is just for social media, so perfectly fine. Um, backgrounds in this subject, really smooth, really, really smooth. Uh, here's another example. This is stop down. You could, st I believe this is around 3, 3.5, F3.5. Uh, this is stop down, but just look at the detail that I'm getting in her shirt. Really, really, like for a lens that is under a hundred dollars, very few, very few lenses are going to be able to beat this. Great colors, turn off processing. Not even much processing done on this. Again, log profile, so not an objective experience, but that sharpness, the the contrasts. The blacks are blacks, the whites are whites. Even though I'm getting a, a sunset reflection on the lake behind, the contrast is a, it's okay, but with some processing, you can get everything to really pop nicely. Um, this is my first attempt at event photography, so it is not good. But another example of the, hi the highlights Oh, this is straight out of camera. This was not in a log profile. Um, I was a little inebriated, so I just set my camera to auto. Uh, so you can see wide open in a dark environment is not fast enough to get moving subjects, especially if you don't have IBIS. I don't have any bot image stabilization in this camera. Uh, so m most of the pictures of this night were just ruined because I wasn't shooting with a flash and I was shooting wide open on auto so I did not have shutter priority so it was using a combination of the ISO and the shutter speed to try to get a proper exposure uh, and it prioritized a slower shutter speed over a higher ISO. Um, lesson learned but I do like this image it's a good example of the, how the highlights can blow out again. I know I'm gonna, I've said that a thousand times. Um, here's an example. I've, this isn't a particularly special image, but I, I mentioned before, if you have a good amount of natural highlights, things can look a little bit wet with this lens. And I like it. I like it, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, you can see on the leaves here, this is, yeah, this is uh, straight out of camera. The, the highlights, the way it transitions from mid-tones to highlights is logarithmic. So the way our eyes see it is linear, but I've noticed this is, I have no evidence. This is just my own, uh, like, uh, this is my own anecdote, anecdotal evidence. Um, as the highlights get brighter and brighter, the way this lens renders them get even more uh, intense. So, like I said, if we view thing view the transition from midtones to highlights linearly, there this lens produces an exponential curve. So highlights get blown out really, really easily. It's it's not a problem to fix for still images. I've noticed a, it's a little bit of an issue with video, but again, it's not impossible to fix. It just requires a little bit of extra work. Um, this is a good example with the helicoid adapter, just how crazy blown out you can get. I've gone over this before, so I'm just going to glaze over this image. Um, what else we got? 
Yeah. Uh, black and white, you get a really classic, old school look to things. I, I've said it a thousand times on this video, I love the texture bokeh you get. The, the out of focus background and the texture here just really gives you like an old 1960s, 1970s feel. It's really cool. Fish. Uh, great sharpness. Great, great sharpness. I don't think this was wide open. It might have been. But this is when I was just learning how to use the uh, use the lens, so I just like this image. And we're gonna finish up here with a couple portraits. Look at this. This is exactly what I want in a portrait lens. I want the subject to be perfectly in focus. Great, great sharpness. Backgrounds are just color gradients. For me, when I'm trying to do portrait photography, that's what I want. I want, or subject photography. I do more subject photography than portrait photography, but that's, that's what I want. Okay, if you made it through the whole video, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you can't tell, I love this lens. Uh, this is one of my prized possessions, and it's not specifically because it's valuable, it's very cheap, but in my journey of learning photography, this lens was a huge step, and it brings me so much joy. This is the end of the review section of this video. After this, I'm just gonna show some numbers and some tests with my Geiger counter so we can get some real world tests and I can prove that at least my lens is safe to use on a daily basis for long, long periods of time. I've done this test before, so I already know the answer. Um, Trilla, let's get into that. So I've let this warm up for a little while. You can see it's maxing out at about two point. You can see it's maxing out at about 2.3 microsieverts per hour. And this is the equivalent of basically having it in your pocket or direct skin contact. Oh, we're at about 2.5 now. The highest reading, the highest reading I've ever gotten was 2.7 microsieverts per hour. The lens is about, I want to say, one foot away, and it's only about 10% higher than the background radiation on my rooftop. So if you're storing this in a small apartment, just put it somewhere that is more than two feet away from where you are on a regular basis, and you won't have any detectable radiation exposure. Okay, that's the end of the review. This was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but I'm very passionate about this lens. Really, if, if you have the funds available, it's definitely worth a buy. Um, my name is Alan. I'm a sound engineer and photographer based in Hanoi, Vietnam. I generally do uh, vintage lens reviews and architectural history of North Vietnam. If that's something you're interested in, a like, comment, or subscribe would really help me out uh, while I'm still growing this channel. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, vote in your local elections. If there's any vintage lens that you would like me to review, I have access to huge collections and I'm able to rent them for about two dollars a day. So uh, I'm planning on reviewing all of the Takamars I have access to and a couple of White Elanders next. But if there's anything you want to see, please let me know in the comments or message me on some of my social media. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far in the video, this was a ridiculously long video for the subject. Um, have a great day.